TV yet? Not on TV yet. Really? Uh, no. No agenda. <coughs> looks so unorganized. Oh, I wanted my pencil. I should turn my ball off too. Alright, so 7.01. Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, December 18th, uh, 2018 Planning Board Workshop. Uh, Doreen, could you please call the roll? Corey Tello? Here. Nicholas McGee? Here. Roger Bealey? Here. Rachel Hendrickson? Here. Robin Saunders? Thank you. And um, by me. Oh, Rick DePerry. Here. <laughs> <Perry. laughs> yeah. Not here. Not here. Not here. <laughs> well, She's letting you get subtle. <laughs> I'm on there too. All right. So uh, this workshop is focused on uh, one item, and that is Crossroads Holdings LLC, which has submitted an application for the master plan phase of the plan development review process for phase two of the Scarborough Downs property. Um, does staff have an introduction for this? We do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the applicants in front of the board tonight for the review of a conceptual master plan for phase two of the Scarborough Downs development. Uh, just a reminder, this portion of land is located in the northerly portion of the property adjacent to Payne Road. So the applicant was last before the board in early October uh, for the first review of this master plan, and they have provided a refined submission package for tonight, including the proposed space and bulk standards uh, for this portion of land. So the applicant's proposing to divide the plan development into two distinct development areas, each with unique space <coughs> and bulk standards. The first portion of land is the large parcel labeled as commercial retail anchor on the master plan. This area is generally a gateway to the larger downs property, and it seems appropriate that any allowed use in the CPD zoning district should also be allowed here. Staff also recommends that this portion of land adhere to the town's design standards. The second portion of land is the remaining land on the master plan labeled as light industrial. And here the applicant's proposing two distinct lot types, uh, front lots and back lots. The front lots are directly adjacent to the proposed public streets, and the back lots are generally located uh, to the rear of the site along the proposed uh, private streets. <coughs> Staff encourages the board to have a discussion with the applicant about design treatment and exceptions along various segments of the proposed public ways. Uh, so the first sort of idea is the segment along Street A within the westerly portion of the development and along Street B uh, provides a connection with the remainder of the Downs development and offer greater opportunities for enhanced streetscape treatment, building design, and parking buffering standards similar to other business districts in town. The segment along Street A uh, within the easterly portion of the development seems more compatible with the development patterns provided by the applicant. The staff would also like to note that the applicant's team has been meeting with the town's energy committee to discuss the idea of utilizing renewable energy within this phase of development. So the applicant should be sure to discuss these efforts with the board tonight. So we've, ho we've provided a host of review comments in our memo, um, but at this point I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, I will hand it over to Mr. Bacon. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Dan Bacon with Coral Palmer, and here on behalf of Crossroads Holdings LLC, uh, Rocky Rizbera uh, from the development team is also here. And uh, I want to thank the board again for having this special meeting. Um, I know how busy board members are with lengthy agendas, um, and I think it's I just really appreciate the opportunity to have this kind of separate discussion to talk about master planning outside of your typical planning board meeting. Um, so again, thank you for accommodating us. Um, and as Mr. Torres introduced, uh, we have been before the board a few times now for this area of the, the property. Um, first for the site inventory analysis step in your plan development process back in the, in the summer and then the initial master plan introduction and discussion we had earlier this fall. Uh, just to <coughs> kind of orient the board and remind, remind you where we're talking about and some of the specifics and also for those that are in the audience and, and watching from home. Uh, this part of the, the Downs property is up by Payne Road. Um, it's where we've called it the Innovation District really um, based on 
the goals for this area to be an employment center and a, and a modern one at that with light industrial manufacturing, um, high technology type uses. Um, it's um, connected to the rest of the property, but also has the opportunity to be kind of be buffered and off on its own um, from the remainder of the mixed use project. Um, and as you see here, um, you can see you know where in the downs it's located and it's it's proximity to Payne Road as well as um, the turnpike, which is off to the to the left of the screen. In terms of the goals for the district, um, as I mentioned, it's it's designed really to be an economic hub for the project and also for the town and the region. Um, and so we anticipate and, and plan for. Um, retail and more commercial type development happening at the corner of Payne Road and coming in off of the Downs Road from Payne Road um, and have designed a large parcel to accommodate those uses and then the remainder of of this phase and plan development portion of the project uh, we plan for those manufacturing light industrial type uses and have laid it out to be um, conducive to a wide range of sizes of, of businesses and light industrial activity um, it uh, has great potential to provide a lot of employment for the project, for the town, and for the region. And as was talked <coughs> a lot about over the summer and fall, it has a lot of a strong kind of return on investment potential for the community in terms of the tax value it creates in exchange for the fairly minimal services <coughs> it will demand. Um, and we're thinking about ways to make it uh, designed in a sort of an innovative way, um, a contemporary way for to attract those types of users um, to this portion of the project. In terms of our overall design goals, and, and we covered these um, at your last uh, meeting on this, but I just wanted to touch on briefly. Um, we have been planning for this, um, even though it's going to be more kind of commercial light industrial uses to be an attractive commercial gateway um, into the project, again, particularly by Payne Road. And we've structured the space and bulk standards in compliance with the town's design standards to be uh, reflective of that, where the, the main downs road is going to be improved coming in and off of um, Payne Road. So that corner site, we want to be particularly attractive and welcoming um, into the project from this side of the project and from the street system. Um, we've been uh, coordinating a lot with uh, the transit providers in the region um, around, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, but around being a kind of a transit, transit friendly and, and ready um, part of the project. And um, so uh, we're looking at how this site can best be served by the transit providers in the region and also be walkable and bikeable, similar to other phases of the project, but in more of kind of a light industrial uh, setting. Um, so we've been paying a lot of attention to kind of sidewalk and trail connections, particularly as it relates to uh, Warren Woods, which is um, a significant conservation parcel to the kind of east and north. And, and thinking about trail connections to Warren Woods for the benefit of those that want to visit Warren Woods, but also uh, visitors and employees in this part of the project. So we want this area to be kind of well-planned, um, attractive for kind of a more of a light industrial setting um, and be comfortable for kind of all modes of, of travelers um, into and outside of the, this part of the project. Um, we've been thinking a lot about buffering and there's a requirement for buffering to adjacent residential zones. Um, so we've been providing for a 100-foot buffer, uh, particularly around the <coughs> eastern side of, of this phase of the project to buffer Warren Woods and um, any future development that might happen um, in, to the south where there's some residential zoning that's not conserved through Warren Woods. And also kind of connected but buffered um, to other parts of the project particularly to the, to the southeast. Um, so in terms of the overall layout, um, and this has been modestly updated since you, you last uh, saw this layout. Um, so access would come in off of the Downs Road um, from Payne Road, and then about 1,000 feet down from Payne Road. Uh, we're proposing a um, 
primary public street to provide access over to the light industrial lots. I'm looking at it from kind of left to right. Um, and, and that would be, you know, a street that heads all the way over to the eastern side of the parcel towards Warren Woods. And then we're proposing a public road connection down to or up front, however you want to look at it, to the rest of the Downs uh, property that will be developed in the future to the south. So um, there will be essentially two public streets planned in, um, within the project limits. And then you see a number of other, what look like streets, uh, on, on the plan. Those are proposed to be essentially shared driveways and right-of-ways for access to front and back lots that are proposed off of them. Um, and they'll also provide the public utilities necessary to serve all of those lots. So the water lines, the sewer lines, electric, will all be within those kind of shared rights of way and, and drives. Um, overall, uh, this layout creates um, about, or precisely, 55 lots. Um, again, one large, actually three larger lots out towards Payne Road, and then the remainder are um, the light industrial lots that are um, off of this new public street. Generally, the lots are proposed as acre lots, so 200 by 200. Um, there's some different size lots where that kind of that size and geometry can't be created based on wetlands and the, the design of the road. And they're designed to be kind of modular like we talked about in the past where they can be bought and added together um, to accommodate larger development than you could accommodate on acre. So they're generally geared for 10 to 15,000 square foot buildings and parking, but again, can, can accommodate up to you know, 100 based on, or, or more, uh, based on how many lots are acquired and then assembled together to create uh, the light industrial users. So all those lots are shown in the, in the, um, in the cream color. And then the, the surrounding <coughs> area is, uh, is largely open space and uh, a mix of wetlands, some trails, and some stormwater, uh, stormwater ponds that are planned to serve the to serve this area of the project. Um, and so we've focused the conservation, again, where there are large tracts of wetlands, particularly on the northern edge of, of the site up here. This is roughly 25 acres uh, that we anticipate being um, left in open space and it's directly contiguous with Warren Woods that's located to the, to the north and east of this, this area. There is some uplands, there's uh, mostly wetlands, and we've been coordinating with the land trust on um, trail interconnections and, and that relationship between this open space and, and their property. Um, we also anticipate our larger open space and wetland conservation area down here between the proposed street and the Downs Road that will be extended. And then this is that buffer area uh, we're providing to Warren Woods and to the adjacent properties and some two stormwater ponds would be would be provided here with the trail system um, navigating <coughs> the entire project and connecting in various locations into the street grid so there's good access to trails that can be used within the project and then connect over to Warren Woods for um, eventual access to their trail system. So in terms of the, the, sh the public street design, uh, we've been designing the street to have kind of gateway features coming into um, both ends of the project with a, a landscaped median um, and esplanades and sidewalks. Uh, we're designing for you know 11 foot travelways, five foot bike lanes and shoulders, uh, very similar to the phase one uh, Downs Road cross section that uh, the boards reviewed in the past, and then keeping with the same, with the same uh, lane widths and, and layout other than not having a landscaped median for the rest of the public street design where you have 11 foot travel lanes, five foot shoulders and bike paths, um, or excuse me, bike lanes. 
uh, planted esplanades and we're anticipating a sidewalk on one side for um, the remainder of the, the street network in the project. So in terms of um, kind of what's new around uh, and what we've been working on in terms of this master plan that we didn't present at your first meeting was details around the space and bulk standards, so the setbacks and the lot sizes and um, those details that the board had works with us on approving um, before we move forward with next steps, such as subdivision. So as Jamal introduced, we really have kind of two separate areas that we've classified on uh, different space and bulk standards. Um, the first area is highlighted here, and that's that larger uh, land area out towards Payne Road that we anticipate to be more commercial, retail. Um, gas stations are allowed under the zoning in close proximity to Payne Road. Really kind of more commercial, commercial activity versus light industrial activity. And so recognizing that and recognizing around this site is zoned Business 3, which is a commercial zone um, that we'd expect similar development activity. Uh, we use a lot of the same space and bulk standards as the B3 has. Um, we've modified the setback to allow buildings to be a little bit closer to the street than the B3, but otherwise we establish essentially the same standards. So we set a minimum lot area of 10,000 square feet. That's um, allowed for in, in that zone. Uh, a minimum street frontage of <coughs> 200 feet, which we, you know, for this particular site, we have we have uh, certainly more than. Um, and we established a front yard setback of 15 feet, but also in the zone um, as a requirement, there's a, there's a 15 foot kind of landscaped area required. So that can also serve as a landscape buffer to um, the street. And then we proposed a five foot side and rear yard setback um, really to allow for buildings to be you know, sited close together when there are maybe multiple lots within this area. Um, so, and that's consistent with um, the allowances under kind of phase one. We've also used the, um, also proposing a 85% um, impervious surface, so buildings and parking um, for this location, but a net of no more than 75% overall within, you know, this development area. Um, and we're using the same building height limitations that this, the Crossroads District allows, um, which is six stories and 75 feet. We don't anticipate <laughs> six stories, 75 feet happening here, but um, we've just duplicated what the zone already allows. So that's the Cain Road parcel. Um, and I think I'll just keep going and then we can have discussions that make sense. And then the other area, um, which is a good bit different, is this innovation district um, portion of the plan. And that's all the other lots that are off of the proposed, um, off of Payne Road and off of the Downs Road. Um, and so in this area, we're in this graphic shows it, we're proposing really kind of two different treatments for lots. Um, there's lots that front the public street, which is shown in blue, and then there's these back lots that would be accessed by these shared driveways um, that I talked about earlier, and um, that's shown in the orange, and it's included in your um, submission. And we have two different treatments really because we felt like there's um, a lot more visibility uh, from the street of the, the front lots. And so architecturally, um, even though it's light industrial, we felt there should be a higher standard for those lots versus the back lots, where the back lots are going to be um, difficult to see from the street. Um, perhaps the uses that choose to, to buy back lots might be more utilitarian than the ones that are up, up by the street. So kind of architecture and design and, and presentation to the streets less we felt was less important. And, and we worked with staff on kind of reviewing this initially. Um, so we have these front and back lot kind of typologies. 
And then also within the proposed standards, and each of the different lot typologies have the setback and <coughs> standards that are a little bit different that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and also on this page in your submission, uh, we have some building form standards. And as the board members might remember when we had this area of the overall zone, the zoning updated, and it was light industrial manufacturing uses were added. It was agreed that this area of the project, if there are those types of uses, um, don't need to meet the town's commercial design standards, but there should be, as part of this process, some standards specific to um, the downs around light industrial type buildings. So to address that, um, we've added some minimum building form standards or building standards. Um, and so in here we've added a, a minimum height requirement. We have typically maximum height requirements, but we had a minimum height requirement of 10 feet. It's not a significant height requirement, but one that ensures the front facade is of adequate height to kind of address to the street. Um, I think as important or more important, we've added requirements around fenestration. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second in the front and the back lots. But the definition of fenestration is window and door openings and other kind of architectural treatment along a building facade so that it's not a, essentially a blank wall or a corrugated metal blank wall. Um, so that it adds, so that it's attractive, that it um, has a good kind of presentation to the street. And people understand where the building entrance is and um, it has a higher aesthetic than a typical and industrial park. So in terms of the details around the front lot um, in your packages, we've showed a, f a couple different scenarios, um, but their building kind of placement requirements are, are the same, um, really kind of meaning what the minimum setbacks are. And so are the building form <coughs> requirements, so the fenestration requirements. <coughs> and these two different scenarios show two different ways that these front lots can be built out. Um, one being allowing you know, a parking area in front of the building and also to the side, um, as well as allowing for the building to come forward towards the street and have just parking to the side or the rear. Um, in terms of the actual setbacks, we're proposing under both scenarios a front yard setback minimum of 10 feet, um, which allows buildings to be relatively close to the street. Uh, recognizing our street design is going to provide an actually 15 feet of esplanade between the edge of the traveled way and the property line. So overall from the street, you'd have almost a 25 foot setback if a building was built uh, right at the, the front setback. In terms of, uh, <clears throat> there's two different side yard setback standards. One, if the side yard also is occupied by that shared driveway I mentioned, which is here and here. On that side of a lot that has, that abuts that private drive, <coughs> the building setback from the property line is 22 feet. And that probably sounds like a random number, but it's it's not in that these shared drives are designed to be 24 feet wide and half of that 24 foot width. So 12 feet would be occupied by the shared drive and then another 10 foot essentially set back from that travel way. So it's really en enables the same kind of situation where you have 10 feet um, of green space or separation to where the building can, can be from, from that shared drive. On a side setback where there isn't a shared drive and utilities in the, in the right of way or that easement area, the setback is proposed to be 10 feet. Um, and then on the rear yard, on front lots, we also contemplate the potential for shared drives um, to provide access to the rear of, of the front site, <coughs> the front of the rear site or the back lot, 
So we are proposing that same 22 foot distance so that there's space for half of the shared drive and then a 10 foot distance to the building. As you can see on this example, that layout also could enable that shared drive to create access to some parking that might happen behind the building. Um, so kind of the method to how we arrived at these setbacks and, and we think they work well for the lot sizes um, and the layout of the project. They wouldn't work well just anywhere in town. So it's kind of zoning that's customized for, for this project um, and the layout of the project. In terms of the building uh, fenestration and other kind of building standards, um, we've included where the primary elevation of the building, so the, the face of the building that faces the public street, uh, a requirement, so that's like the darker blue area on these images, um, would have a minimum of a 50% fenestration requirement facing that, that side of the, facing the street, on that side of the building. So what that would mean is 50% of um, the, the wall square footage of the building, uh, square footage of the building wall, would need to be windows, doors, other architectural treatments that make it interesting, make it look like a, um, an occupied building, um, and add kind of visual interest in a connection to the street. So that's what we're proposing on that street edge. On the secondary um, building face, if you will, so the side that faces the, the private drive, we're proposing that percentage be 15% um, fenestration, um, again, to have some windows and openings, but it being less important on that private drive than the aesthetics from the public street. It's also designed to kind of encourage, it's not wouldn't be required, but encourage more of the occupied space of a building. So say you have part kind of back, back room or operations or warehousing, whatever it might be, and encourage more of the office side to be f towards the public street. Wouldn't be required, but the design standards would suggest that you would do that. So the back lot is different. Um, like I mentioned, you wouldn't see it at least well from the public street. Um, so the fenestration, the building form requirements are less. That would be the 15% for the side that faces um, the secondary or the, I guess in the case of this, <coughs> still the secondary frontage. Um, and the building setbacks are a little bit different. I mean, they're the same dimensions, there's how they relate to the sides are a little bit different. So in the case of a back lot, there isn't public street frontage, um, but there is that same kind of side yard or, or frontage along the shared drive. So we kept that dimension the same at 22 feet minimum for the building to the, the common property line. Um, we established a 22 foot set back from what could be a shared driveway um, between the back lot and the front lot, like I talked about the front lot earlier. And then the other setbacks would be 10, similar to the frontage lot. In the case of this one, it's a rear lot line just to, to the open space would be 10 feet, and then the side yard to a neighboring parcel that's not on a private driveway would also be 10 feet. So. Hopefully I haven't confused you all. <laughs> but it's a good chance that I have, so we can come back to these things. Um, but that's the, our current thoughts around um, space and bulk for the light industrial area. As Ms. Jamel introduced um, earlier, this is totally off the topic of space and bulk. We've been doing some other things since our last meeting around outreach to other organizations and other topics. I just wanted to touch on those briefly and then I'll kind of wrap up in terms of where we are in permitting overall. But so a few of the things that we're really focused on with, with this phase of development um, and have been 
discussion with Angela and the Energy Committee. As recently as last week, we had a subcommittee meeting, um, which is a subset of the Energy Committee that's um, kind of partnering with us on ideas, and, and Jamal participated as well, and others around um, alternative energy and how it can play a role in this phase of the project and also future phases, but this is the phase that we're deep into right now. Um, so we've been thinking about and working with the Energy Committee, but also Revision Energy around some of these concepts. And so they're in progress, and we really want to kind of give you an update as to where we've been and where we're headed. We don't have any firm, concrete things that we um, can present, but we can present kind of the discussions we've been having. One of which is we've been looking at um, the potential for like solar fields within our open space that isn't either wetland or <coughs> stormwater ponds. Um, the site is quite flat, so it's conducive to kind of siting these um, based on topography. Also, um, around stormwater ponds where we're going to be clearing anyway um, for construction. We're going to be building access roads for just to maintain the ponds. There's some, op there's some good opportunities to, to consider solar that could um, obviously provide power to the, to the site. And we, we need to kind of work through, okay, who's the owner of that? What's the, the ROI on that? But we're far enough along that Revision's given us good feedback around the capacity of the space, the design of the space, um, and we're now exploring kind of the, the financial model for that. So that's been ongoing, um, and we've been working pretty hard on that. Um, we've talked in the past about solar on, on rooftops, which is more of kind of a site-by-site -site thing with this light, light industrial buildings, and we do want to encourage that and, and keep pursuing that. Um, we're starting to talk about whether there's a role for, um, and it's probably hard to see receipts, but this picture shows the concept of um, solar-powered streetlights, um, which don't necessarily have a huge impact in terms of, um, you know, carbon reduction, that kind of thing, but it, it could be a, an important statement for the project. It also could make financial sense for the team and the town from a long-term kind of cost of maintenance and, and cost of electricity standpoint. So we're looking into that with and working with the town on, the, on that concept. Um, and then there are some other kind of conversations ongoing. We're maybe going to do a field trip sometime to other places that have like microgrid technology and I would talk more about it if I knew more about it. But I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> um, but there are folks on the energy committee that, that do and I think so that's something that uh, we're at least going to learn more about as it relates to the potential of this project. So we're kind of getting up to speed on alternative energy and continue to kind of take it seriously. Um, the other big discussion we've been having is specifically with the transit agencies about how to serve this part of the project. Um, and we've talked to all three major transit agencies, Metro, Shuttle Bus, um, and South Portland Bus Service. And we're now looking at, they're really kind of run some numbers as to, okay, what would it cost for them to run service from where it's stops currently for South Portland and Metro, it stops around Main Mall and up by Walmart in Scarborough um, and extending that service down to the site. Um, and we're also talking to Metro about potential of the service along Route 1, which is more tied to the Phase 1 like we've talked about in the past. Um, and the main Turnpike Authority has also been part of those discussions because they um, they are partners on the Zoom service, the, the bus line that goes from Biddeford uh, direct into Portland. And so they've expressed some interest if there's enough ridership of, of um, being involved. So obviously when you're presenting a plan and you don't have any riders, <laughs> it's a, <coughs> kind of a, obviously it's an undeveloped parcel. There's, it's kind of the chicken or the egg thing. Um, so 
you know, we're talking to these transit providers, recognizing that service isn't necessarily going to be provided prospective, like, like pre-development. Um, but being in a position to say, okay, if we reach certain, have certain users or a certain threshold, then that triggers um, their participation. So we're starting to talk about, okay, what's the, what's the threshold for them besides thinking it's a good idea um, of providing some service. So we're in, in those discussions um, and we'd like it to be part of our kind of traffic movement permit process as well because I know the Turnpike Authority is ultimately is going to be concerned about implications of the project on exit 42 and the more trips, um, more capacity they can preserve on their system and at inter key intersections, um, the happier they are. So, you know, they have a vested interest in kind of working with us to see viable transit as well to reduce the need for improvements on their system. Um, so. We're ongoing with those conversations, and I thought it was important to update the board on that. And I think more will come when we're in subdivision, when we have more detailed conversations on traffic and traffic movement permit. Um, and the last piece is the land trust connections. I mentioned that briefly earlier, um, but we continue to, to work with them. They actually came to uh, a um, DEP informational meeting we had a few weeks ago on the project, and we're looking at the trail connections, um, trailhead parking, and a few different locations um, to provide access to the trails in our project, but also their site, um, as well as the kind of the relationship of our open space with, with, with theirs. Um, so that's been our recent kind of outreach on those key pieces of of this phase of the project. And lastly, I just thought it was worthwhile to, given the many steps that are involved, <laughs> to put it on paper at a high level to, to show you know, what, what the progression is. Um, we have our master plan review tonight, our second time presenting um, to you folks on that. And then following your approval of master plan, Heading into the you know winter, spring, um, we would then proceed um, towards preliminary and then final subdivision, like typical planning board process, commercial subdivision versus residential. Um, but you have the same process around reviewing the the subdivision plan at a preliminary level and then a final subdivision level, and then there's a variety of state and federal kind of jurisdictions that have their step in the process, um, which includes the site law application to DEP, which also includes stormwater. Um, that didn't happen with phase one because it was under the threshold for site law in Scarborough. Um, there's the DEP and the Army Corps, essentially wetland permitting that we're working on right now. Um, we've worked hard to minimize wetland impacts and uh, design our road to kind of skip from one upland to the other to get to the core development area of the project, but there are some wetland impacts also with kind of the widening of the Downs Road coming up to, to Payne Road. And then there's the main DOT traffic movement per permitting process that we're preparing for and we'll work on concurrent, <coughs> concurrent with the planning board subdivision review. So that's what I have for presentation. And I'll Thank you for that. And um, before we have board discussion, we have the opportunity for any public comment. Um, if there are any questions for the applicant or for the board for that matter, we'll do our best to address those through board discussion. So anyone would like to uh, come on up now, this is your chance at least for tonight. There will be other opportunities as things move forward. All right, seeing none. Board discussion. Who wants to kick it off? Corey, if I, if I might, I think if you don't mind, if I just I suppose we'll let Steph. <laughs> just a few words. I, I think one of the things that at, 
as you know, Jamel and I and Angela have looked at this, one thing that is helpful to keep in mind is sort of the scale of development. And I know we've talked about this yep. throughout, but being mindful that we really are talking about 150 acres and as we look at the road segments, you know, what are the different users and use types that might be, you know, again, as uh, Dan talked about back in, I think it was the summer, spring, or fall, some point, there was the uh, introduction of these additional uses um, that are more consistent with sort of light industrial, industrial uses, and where sort of, as we're thinking about the scale of the project, um, just being mindful of, you know, sort of what, what those development patterns and the, the uses of the various street segments might be um, are a helpful way, at least for staff, as we looked at it, to sort of frame and keep in mind, mm -hmm. you know, this, yeah, this is a, when you look at it on paper, it's hard to, sometimes it can be hard to remember really what you're looking at. And so I just sort of wanted to offer that before we launched in. That's yeah, that's a good reminder. And I had, I did have that thought as when that image was put back up, because I remember the last time we were here having a workshop I think it, for a few of us, it was it didn't initially sink in just what that scale was, and I think it's good to constantly remind ourselves of that, particularly when you look at some of those different road segments and just the overall scale. So, thanks. I, I can go if you want. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I have a question on your <coughs> on your parcel uh, parcel type A's. You know your diagrams on. You know, the buildings and the setbacks and everything. Yep. The thing that um, it's, uh, I noticed all, you have uh, a lot of the parking is right on the right close to the street. Isn't part of the, uh, especially on the front lots, don't you want to have the parking in the back away from the, the main streets as much as possible? In other words, this, I'm assuming are these the model, this is the model you're going to be going by, or is this just example just to show us the setbacks it's an example of how the setbacks relate to where building and parking can go so it's it isn't the only um, build out scenario that could happen on these lots um, but it's the most likely two scenarios uh, in part because if, sorry this doesn't work on that so I'm gonna point, even though it's behind you I'm gonna point to this one <laughs> Um, <coughs> the intent here is, so this is the proposed public street, and these are the shared drives. That's the one I was thinking about. Yep. Um, and the intent is that these shared drives, this is where you get access. So that's why these two parking lots look the same, uh, in that, you know, we want to present a subdivision plan that's predictable in terms of where are all the driveways going to go, so that's easy to review uh, and approve. So that's why we've shown these two scenarios that are the parking lots are accessed like this, you know, from these two points. Um, we'd like the opportunity to enable both to <coughs> happen. You know, this this scenario, the building's up against the street. Um, I think it can work for a lot of users. It may not work for for all users. Um, so that's why we showed this scenario where there could be a strip of parking um, in front of the building. So my, I guess my question is, why wouldn't you have that strip of parking in the back of the building on that one on the left? There's some users that want to have um, more pub like office guest parking out front and want to have shop space in the back where you know there's maybe overhead doors in the back that um, access this rear drive that you don't want to co-mingle you know say this um, you know these are people the office workers within the building or people coming for a meeting that you don't want to have you know, share it, you know, sharing the same parking space here. Um, that was the idea to have this be kind of more public side, this be more kind of private, private side in the back. Um, I go to Rocky's office um, all the time, and they have that situation where there's out front, there's, I would say, I would call it a modest amount of parking. There's, you know, there's 12 spaces, whatever it might be. 
the building's still pretty close to the street. Now these are only acre lots. Um, and then they have overhead doors in the back and then they have storage in the back and things in the back that you wouldn't want. He wouldn't want me parking next to, I know that. <laughs> so we wanted that kind of flexibility. Okay, um, and then you would have landscaping in, um, in the uh, section where it says A? That would be land, would that be landscaping? Yes, yeah, so that we have a 10 foot area that would be, would be landscaping, exactly. And would supplement the street, you know, the streetscape along the public street. Roger, sure. if, uh, if I may. Um, yeah, I think the point you raise is, is one of the things that we had thought about and is sort of embedded in one of our bullets and is really thinking about recognizing that there is this pretty frankly consistent, I think as Dan mentioned, they looked at what the B3 allows and it really talks about in the B3, um, when you're along a major road, it talks about having a 15 foot streetscape, um, sort of a, a setback, if you will, that's landscaped and along other internal roads, a 10 foot setback. So I think that's consistent with sort of that general layout of what the B3 would expect. The only thing that's not stated in here is sort of the the, the statement about the um, it being uh, landscaping, landscape, and buffering at least yeah. the parking at least minimally. You know, it's not going to probably shield it all, but um, and so that was really one of our comments as well. Was maybe it's worth for some segments of the road, maybe the whole thing. You know, depending on where the board thinks. You know, just sort of enhancing that statement a little bit to, to, to your notion, really to what this is hedging towards, um, and just really codifying that a little more clearly. Um, if that's something the board's interested in. Um, overall, I, I think I mean I think it's going along fine. I mean, I'll be interested to hear what my colleagues have to say. But that was the, that was the only thing I was just wondering about on that. So. Okay, thanks, Nick. <clears throat> um, yeah. So first, I'll start with saying thank you because I know one of the last comments coming out of the board was trying to get some sort of standard, some sort of codification to what it is we were going to require out of the building. <coughs> I just want to leave it open-ended. So I, I appreciate those efforts to kind of get get this on paper for us to review, and it's a good guideline. Um, I do have one question relating to that. Um, there's notes on here that says accessory buildings are not required to meet the above design requirements, which I understand, but is there somewhere that, somewhere else written? what an accessory building definition is, and not only that, what kind of standards they would be held to. I think that would be one other thing that would mm -hmm. be nice to clarify. Um, you know, I, get the, I get what you're doing with the main building, no big questions there, but if we come across the accessory building question, yep. what, are we look, you know, what are we really trying to get approved? So um, outside of that, on, on that end of it, I'm okay. I, I, I do concur with... Uh, Roger, that maybe a little bit more codifying around maybe some buffering and um, the parking area. I don't. I know what you're doing in this area, so I don't necessarily believe it needs to be dragged up to the street front like we like to see in other areas of town. Um, so I'm I'm okay with what you're proposing in that sense, but it might help to um, at least have some some sort of reference in. Codifying part about you know what what are we going to consider for buffering? Yep. What what does that look like? Um, that I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more definition around. Um, let's see. And I also um, I think it's um, I think it's fine the way you define the front lots, the rear lots. That seems reasonable and I think it's probably a good solution for what it is you're looking at out there. Um, I don't have a whole lot else and I do come across an extra note of mine. I'll, I'll raise my hand again. All right. Thank Thanks. You. I'll go next. I don't have a lot. Um, I just have some, some little things I wanted to ask about and it may be a little bit premature because we're doing master plan but as far as the trails that you're doing, I, I, the anticipation that they're going to be, you know, kind of like the Portland Trail Association trails are going to be gravel and um, somewhat maintained. And I think you mentioned um, solar lighting or something to that effect. Um, I, you don't need to answer those questions now, but I'd like to at some point see 
a little bit more how that's going to be, you know, handled. Yeah, um, I can start to answer, and then we can also, I think it'll evolve to through the subdivision process, and we nail things down further, but um, our plan is to have a mix of different surfaces. In some places, um, we want to be more kind of low impact because they're they're either in the buffer to the abutting property um, or they're in, you know, places that'll be hard to get equipment in to build like a bike path or an eastern trail type path. Um, in other places, the trails are likely going to be um, along, say, the stormwater pond or they're maybe going to serve multiple purposes where it's also providing access for maintenance of the stormwater pond where those can be um, built to a higher standard. So we're kind of working through that <coughs> differentiation um, as we kind of further de the design, but that's the that's the direction we're likely to head. Um, and in, in a few other locations, we're, we might need wetland permitting for the trails, so those probably would be kind of more like bog bridges or um, kind of low-impact trails that are minimize their wetland impact. Um, and then on the, uh, yeah, that's the one I want right there. So they all seem, all the roads have a hammerhead except for the one. I was curious as to why that was and if that was just, it just didn't work there. The um, second one end on the left, if you're driving down it, at least on my plan, doesn't have the hammerhead at the end. And it kind of leads into my next question is, I'm assuming this is going to be a public street. No public street? So there's no town plowing? Uh, so the, the proposal is for the sort of main stem to be a public street, and then there's a, yep, right going down there to be public. I can't point at the Oh, sorry, right. Right. sorry, you're <laughs> not looking at the two. <laughs> so uh, okay. main this is public. And this is public. There's another segment being shown, yep. That will connect to the rest of the project, ultimately. The rest of these are proposed to be private drives okay. and we've been going back and forth on the the design of the private drives <coughs> in terms of yeah. whether we show a turnaround so you're probably looking at the plan that shows a private drive turnaround that yeah. we anticipate will happen as sites site plans are approved to okay. provide turnaround for emergency vehicles All right. i mean I'm, I'm less concerned if they're i still would like i know you guys could I'm less concerned if they're private than public because I'm not. I was a little concerned about how the plow truck was going to get in there and, and turn around because we were just talking about it recently. And then at the very end, right there, mm -hmm. it's just a thought, but I've, I've seen it. I haven't seen it in Maine a lot, but I've, I've seen it out west quite a bit. That um, they do a roundabout at the end, so that the like the public transportation, if you're going to have a public bus go down there at some point, um, they can call the sec. Yeah, well, actually, like a roundabout, almost like on 114 and, you know, um, okay, and 112, mm -hmm. where they have those three roundabouts. So that it, it makes it easy for the plow trucks to turn around, or easier, and it makes it um, nice for the for a public bus if if a public bus has to go down there. I mean, if you use the smaller ones, it doesn't really matter, <coughs> but the bigger ones. Um, and I think a roundabout looks nice. You could put some nice. Nice uh, shrubbery in the middle. So, um, okay, and then uh, I know you're in the early stages of talking about the with the energy group and everybody on renewable power and all that stuff. Um, but when you get to that point and start defining that, it'd be nice to know who's going to actually own the panels. Whether it's going to be part of the association or if the buildings are going to own their own and I know it's going to be a little bit different but at some you know there's maintenance associated with those panels and there's a longevity issue um, at some point solar panels are no longer working and someone's got to do something with them and and we're not really seeing that here in Maine because we obviously don't have a lot of sun so we don't have a lot of solar panels but out west, they're struggling with that. People just abandoning solar panels and stuff like that. So, um, so I'd like to know who's going to own the list, actually. Mm -hmm. 
And then as far as the bus goes, and, and I'm not sure, maybe someone else on the board knows, I was just happened to be reading that recently I was working on a project. They're doing some electric buses in Portland. Um, and it had to, I'm not sure how the public transportation works. On, on the, I, I thought it was subsidized by the towns. So I'm not 100% sure on that. So um, it'd be great to have public transportation in this whole Downs area, but I'd kind of want to see how more on how much, if that was going to impact the town budget or not, and things like that. Um, all right, yeah, that's, that's everything. I think what you're doing looks great. I like the I like the way it's laid out. I like the way that you did it as a grid. I think it's great that you're making these modular and so that people could use one or they could use four. Um, and. I'll, on the commercial retail, and I'll be all done, is the commercial retail anchor portion of that. I know you haven't done any roads in there yet, um, but for a master plan, it's all good. But at some point, I'd kind of like to see, obviously, see how that's all going to work out. So I, I think it looks great. I think you're going in the right direction. And, um, I'd like to see you turn around down the end, maybe. Rock will let me have that. I'll think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel. Yeah. Um Picking up on what Rick just said about the uh, commercial area, I'm a little uh, troubled by the sort of terra incognita there of about 50, 50 acres for the commercial retail uh, with no notion exactly what's going to be in there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm seeing one curb cut, could be more, and you could just have thrown one in. Um, so that, 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 that troubles me because the rest of it is very well thought out and very well laid out and I, I like the concept of the, um, the flexibility for folks who might want to get one lot or five lots or however they want to do it but I'm, I'm troubled by the lack of information um, on that here there be dragons from the old maps in, is, yeah, uh, so you're not really where are you going with that commercial retail area? What have, what's been your thinking thus far? I'm happy, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to point to this one. Cause I, yeah, I'll turn around. Go ahead. But um, there is a, a method to the madness in terms of the layout of this lot um, and what it could accommodate. So the lot is designed, and this road is designed um, really to kind of allow for the most realistic kind of upland area for commercial development. So this, this road is essentially kind of tucked um, furthest south possible without impacting wetlands um, to allow for you know, a fairly large development area that could accommodate up to, I would say, 150, 175,000 square foot building if one was going to go there and gas or sort of any combination of smaller buildings so you could see like a um, you know maybe it's an 80,000 square foot building with some out, par out parcels or out kind of smaller retail buildings and uh, service station out closer to <coughs> Payne Road so the lot size is really kind of premised on enabling that largest user down, um, coupled with avoiding as many wetlands as possible. There's you know wetland area here that would provide a nice break between what happens here and the light industrial. Those are those lighter colors, Rachel, are kind of wetlands. Yeah. Um, and also stormwater management. You know, so that's. Those are two of the factors in this layout. Another factor is capacity and design of the Downs Road um, and allowing for space to have turn lanes, you know, out onto Payne Road and also turn lanes into the street that provides access to light industrial, but also could provide access to this lot. So that, that road alignment is, again, tucked as far away from Payne Road as possible to allow for those different traffic movements to happen and the, and the requisite kind of lanes to make that happen. Um, and we've anticipated that perhaps there's a, 
intermediate connection to this parcel, really, again, to relieve all the traffic going on this road to get into that Payne Road parcel. So if there's a, a shorter you know, left turn in, <coughs> then this is going to have more capacity to handle the traffic that it needs. And again, not have to get pushed into this more valuable wetland area. Um, so since there's not a, you know, a user all kind of signed up, um, we were reluctant to kind of sh start to show layouts and get into those details. But those are really our design principles around what can be accommodated there and, and why. So, so yeah, go ahead. I was just going to sort of piggyback on sort of the use question, um, and, and maybe I was going to ask Stan, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Um, basically, you know, in the in the Crossroads uh, district, there's, I think, 54 listed permitted uses. A half dozen or eight of those are residential uses, and so far in your narrative, you really talked about this being uh, predominantly commercial. You mentioned the potential for live work, but at this point, that's not completely, you know, completely on the table. And then there's the other sort of half dozen or, or eight or so that really are those um, sort of light industrial uses that were added into the zone a little while ago that where we talked about the design standards aren't applicable. And, and so, Dan, have you um, really thought about of the 54 allowed uses, are you really thinking about, you know, I sort of just spelled out that there's sort of these three buckets of type of uses. We have the residential uses, your typical commercial uses that are still need to adhere to all our design standards and typical expectations that we would have for a commercial lot and then we have these light industrial uses um, mm -hmm. of those three buckets are you thinking have you thought about which ones would be applicable here and maybe you can just speak that sure way. and rocky's in the audience too and i'm sure he can chime in the focus for this parcel lot mm -hmm. has been commercial not light industrial um and that's really why we've established it the size that it is, kind of laid it out the size that it is, and propose um, the different space and bulk standards that we're talking about tonight being more commercial oriented versus the light industrial. Um, can I say that in five years, and they've been putting a real estate sign out there for five years, that we won't come back and say, okay, what's the alternative there? I'm pretty sure we'll be back in front of you to say, hey, there's not a retail <coughs> user or a commercial user that wants that site, then we need to look at it again and, okay, maybe the light industrial shifts a little bit or it's a different kind of mixed-use project. Um, we don't know. But for right now, <coughs> that is our focus is kind of retail, restaurant, um, a gas station which is allowed close to Payne Road, kind of so uses, sort of shopping of center type uses that are customary in this kind of context. So it would be sort of the commercial uses that are listed that are still required to meet the design standards. Correct. We're really not yeah. talking about those Correct. like industrial uses. Yeah. Just one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I, so you're looking to sell that whole thing at once or is that the concept or? There is. It could be. No, it could be multiple parcels depending on. We would come back through subdivision um, to see the board and um, create additional lots. As long as it meets the space and bulk, I think we'd be consistent with the master plan. I think you know the lot lines and master plan are, I think, intended to be pretty fuzzy. Where um, in subdivision they're not. Um, subdivision they're what we get approved. Are you thinking about any sort of a transition between the commercial retail into the light industrial? I, I mean, is it just the commercial stops here, the light industrial starts here, or is there a We've been thinking it's more of usage. a natural transition um, where you have, number one, there's this kind of large wetland system here. Yep. Um, you're looking at it above my head, sorry. <laughs> That is a transition from the Downs Road to the first um, light industrial lot, which would be here. We anticipate the same <coughs> kind of natural buffer is going to come up through here um, in that there's some pretty big wetlands that likely wouldn't be filled for development that would create kind of this green 
gateway um, from what happens closer to Payne Road from the Innovation District. Um, we're also thinking about a, a trail system. It's not well shown here, kind of being part of that coming down from the trails up here. So in terms of development, you're really, really looking to go with the, the uh, light industrial first. Is that the assumption that that's going to be where you're going to be putting most of your efforts in terms of That's where there's at least the first, like a first phase of light industrial. There's, um, there's specific users that want to be here. Um, so... That doesn't mean that a user doesn't come along and want to be here at the same time, but there's known users that are waiting for us to get this designed and get underway. Um, so light industrial is the first phase at least. If there's <coughs> commercial users that become interested or are interested and we um, just don't know it yet, then that may be concurrent. You know, it could happen at the same time. Have you done any estimations about the number of people that would be working in the uh, light industrial area? <clears throat> any, any sort of idea that we think there's going to be 1,000 people, 1,500 workers when it's built out, something like that? Yeah, it's going to be in that range. I mean, we did forecasts with <coughs> Kamoyan Associates um, for the overall build-out, and it was around 3,000 at build-out. Um, this is a, a three thousand both both, no, the the, master, both the commercial and the no I'm sorry the master plan okay so if you take that and this is when you say master plan you mean the entire master, 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 master plan yes the, the, the master master downs. plan the big master this plan um, the entirety of the downs so I think a third of that is realistic in this in this plan development, the innovation district and, and the commercial that we're talking about. Um, I can get you, you know, more detailed numbers. No, I, I just, meeting, but, I, you know. I, I, I kind of, is Jay introduced before we, and Corey, we need to keep in mind, remind ourselves of what, how large an area we're, we're talking about, and it helps me to think in terms of the people that would be in that area, um, what those the the employees the workers that these these um these lots would support yeah. um which then gets me to the question of so or the observation so, so we have all of those lots and we have no place there's there's no place making along there um there's no place for people to go eat there's there's basically a lot of industrial buildings that they may look perfectly wonderful, mm -hmm. um, but we've got a, a potentially a thousand people there with nothing much for them, mm -hmm. other than this is where they work. So um, I think you really need to take a look at creating a, a sense of place mm -hmm. for them to gather. I think um, if you really if you if you're looking at innovation, I mean, really, then then dream a little more. And where would they eat? If they've got a half an hour to go out to lunch, there's a lot of territory there that they're going to have to get out and go someplace. And uh, you know, until you get something built in the commercial area, they don't have a lot of choices about where they're going to where they're going to go eat, where they're going to mm -hmm. take that time. So how would you accommodate the human needs of a thousand people working in this area? Well, I think you, you pointed out as you spoke about it in terms of that corner lot, I mean, part of attracting retail, <coughs> restaurant, um, other commercial users is the light, the first phase of light industrial could do just that. I mean, it, it can open up this area of the project, and then if you add the employment and the activity going on in the light industrial area, the first, say, phase of it, maybe it's the first um, 20 out of the 55 lots, whatever it might be, coupled with <coughs> the act, you know, the, the traffic volumes along Payne Road and proximity to the Turnpike, that may, on its own, induce what you're talking about on that corner. Um, or um, there are 
or other components of the project that we're going to continue to study. So we're not going to build just pieces of the downs in isolation. Um, we know there's significant demand and need for light industrial today. <coughs> um, and that could enable, you know, initial phase of this, this area to be under construction. There also may be other parts of the project that we haven't talked about yet or designed yet that can meet those needs as well. Um, in the core of the project that may happen, that could happen before the Payne Road corner. So um, we first need to kind of get underway and get some critical mass before we, I think these guys can um, execute a restaurant or something else. That, and Or they could happen in this district as well. I mean, those uses are also allowed. I guess that's what I was about to ask, sort of it's very similar to my prior question about what your proposed, you know, of the 54 uses that you're th talking about allowing in the commercial mm -hmm. retail, when we talk about the light industrial, are you really just talking about allowing those six uses um, that, or six or eight, whatever the number is, that were recently added? Or are you thinking that in it, those are sort of in addition to the other commercial type uses that could go there? So if, if a retail shop or a restaurant wanted to go into light, one of these light industrial modular lots, as we're mm -hmm. calling them, would that, are, are those the type of uses you, you're thinking about there? So really sort of opening up having, you know, 48 of the use, use types allowed, or are you really limiting it to those? Well, I mean, think of, like, on Pleasant Hill Road, that industrial area has um, a handful of restaurants that cater yeah. to the activities in that area. So, um, yeah, I think that's possible that those uses happen. We wouldn't want, I don't think our intention is to kind of market in that direction, but if it's if it makes sense, then it could happen. And then, so if those uses are permitted, sort of in the light industrial lots, as we're talking about, mm -hmm. the um, <coughs> they would then fall back to our design standards. Really, it's sort of the the sort of fit, the, mm. the lot layouts that you talked about, and the the sort of additional or not additional, but the, the design standards that you mm -hmm. laid out in sort of the, uh, for those frontage lots, if you will, and those back lots are really about those six or eight uses that have, that don't have design standards that apply to them. That's the way we've been thinking about it. Yep. Yeah, that's Okay, I just yep. want to be sure we're all there because I'm still starting to come to these places <laughs> as well, so. Oh, that's helpful. <laughs> um, I guess just a comment on the layout of the the front and the back lots uh, from the road uh, the way you and, and I know there are many different designs <clears throat> layouts possible um, but I just had a, a vision of all of the buildings let's say on a <coughs> one of the streets where there are three uh, one front light lot and two back lots all yeah. of the buildings being on the right side of, of the lot and somebody looking and just seeing a stretch of parking all the way through the three, through the three lots. So I think some alternative placements um, are really thinking about how the buildings are placed when they are front to back like that um, would be helpful because it would create um, it creates a visual diversity rather than looking and saying all that is is a giant, very long parking lot mm -hmm. with three industrial type buildings. So it's is some of these come before us um, as you talk about them and and market them. It would be very important to think about how the the buildings are laid out from the front to the back. Uh, because otherwise it could get kind of grim. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage you to think about that. I also still encourage you to find a place to make some to make a place, because there's nothing in there where people can gather, where the workers can gather. It's not a parking lot. There's no common area uh, in that 50 acres. About there's nothing. It's, yeah. Uh, other than if they want to go down and find a trail, uh, and that's still more of an individual, um, an ind individual or solo 
activity than finding a place for people to get together at lunch on a break in the mm -hmm. morning. And that doesn't exist there, and I think you need it. Um, I just had a, an, another observation. I know you show a median through some of the lots I, on that road. I think it's B. You show a median partway up. Is that going to stay or is that going to go? Because you're going to have people turning into those lots, I would assume. Um, in what location? Is it? B? Yeah. How are those lot those uh, are those lots going to be accessed from? this B Street there. I hear. So, yeah, we've intentionally designed that to be compatible with the access points to those lots. Um, and then the intention is outside of this area to also have a, a median that creates more continuity. So we've laid that median out so that it doesn't interfere with access to those lots. Those, similar to the other lots, there will be planned curb cuts up front. Um, Okay, so no problem crossing over, getting in and out. Right, the there's going to be a break where, okay. yep. All right, I, th I think um, I would, uh, okay, I just thought of something else. The garage bays, the overhead doors, those really should be designed to be to the rear um, rather than to the side and certainly never to the front. We had an interesting conversation about garage doors with our architect and our team. And garage doors are in style right now um, <laughs> from an architectural standpoint if they're done well. So we had a pretty healthy debate around, okay, if it's a last garage door or a garage door that um, has uh, some design considerations, it might not be a detriment. But garage doors, I think, get a <laughs> bad rap. My, my well, I, I, I think the Rising Tide Brewery that has uh, a garage door um, really to the front, but it's so that people can move from the benches and mm -hmm. the picnic benches and the, the uh, eating areas out, on, out in the parking lot and into the brewery to get their next drink and then back out again. So yeah, there is some, um, there so are some architectural features, yeah. but if we're talking light industrial, we probably mean that that should be in, not necessarily an architectural feature. Right. So maybe we'll come before you and, and have a debate around fenestration, whether that garage door meets the fenestration requirement or not. But no, I understand your point in terms of like typical garage doors are, yeah. they're not, you can't see through them. They're pretty boring looking, but I, I know of a number that are now kind of more said, you know, Just take doors. a look at Rising Tide Brewery yeah. and see what Heather's done there. Right. Um, I think uh, basically that's that's it. I am still uh, concerned about terra incognita because this. Um, I would hate to see something that ends up looking like a, another gallery development there, uh, and with nothing other than forty acres of blank territory, it's a little uh, disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Nick, did you have something else? Yeah, I have just one more thought, and I don't know if this thought is at all shared by anyone else at this board. Um, on lots 45 and 46, um, you know, that's the two lots that are lead into that other area that we don't really mm. quite know or understand what would possibly be there, right? <coughs> So I'm going to, for the sake of these purposes, refer to them as a transitional lot or a gateway lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it would be wise to allow this board some flexibility on the design standards for, quote unquote, any type of transitional lot. So let's just say you have some sort of retail slash residential area going on on the other side of that line, um, you know, pedestrians or whatever. The way you currently have written out your standards here, they might be looking at the back of a warehouse from wherever they sit. And so my point would be, you know, allow in you know a space like that, some flexibility on the, the board's part for 
requesting additional fenestration architectural details because I think it is in, in order for us to envision this light industrial area mm -hmm. and to kind of say hey that's light industrial we're not going to get too harsh on details on garage doors or whatnot um, yeah. it, you know I think that transition is important that separation is kind of important within the development um, so you know you're actually kind of looking at a more of a retail residential side versus a light industrial commercial side. Mm -hmm. And just food for thought for anyone on the board, whether or not that would be wise to try to come up with a standard that includes like a transitional piece of property, whether it's from commercial to light industrial or from residential to light industrial. Because we don't know what's happening on the other side of the line. Right. And you guys probably don't know either. Um, you know, there's such a big parcel and a lot right. of planning to go, so. Well, that's Yeah, and that's the area we've talked to fair fair about um, fair amount about in terms of being um, kind of light industrial research high-tech uses that are allowed in the rest of the project um, that are compatible with what's happening in the innovation district but provide that transition so I don't think anybody wants that to be a harsh um, break between light industrial and the rest of the project. Um, we want to land kind of the right users there and want them to, to want that location um, and to be a kind of a natural feathering into the rest of the project. So um, our intent is to market it that way, where it be um, and design it that way, where it kind of more naturally transitions from kind of light industrial into other commercial uses that are compatible but are allowed in the rest of the project and um, you know that could end up being some of these more kind of public uses that you're speaking about Rachel around providing um, destinations and services to to the light industrial coupled with like em employment high tech type uses that have a synergy with this this part of the project so um, we're, we're thinking about those design considerations, I guess, in that point. And Nick, I think, you know, the point you brought up is, is you know, sort of on where maybe I've, I've been trying to get to but haven't articulated quite clearly. You know, I think this master plan is a really good opportunity for the board to think about what type of uses, and again, we sort of have these, you know, these six or eight light industrial uses that, you know, we've, we've permitted within the area and have said don't have design standards that apply to them. Now, you know, we can certainly build those as we go, as, as you're suggesting, or, or really thinking about what, where are sort of these different buckets of uses that I've talked about um, appropriate throughout this large areas, these 150 acres. You know, are there certain areas that are, are tucked away sort of off what the, you know, off the beaten path, so to speak, where, you know, the more... Um, uh, typical industrial type uses or light industrial uses, a garage door that it doesn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, pizzazz to it might make more sense or, you know, as you get where, where is it that you do concern yourselves with those type of uses that have a garage door that's less about being a loading bay and more about being a functioning space. I think as you're talking about with rising tide, that doesn't sound like a loading bay per se. It's really a people door that happens to be a garage, an overhead door that's well done. So really sort of thinking about sort of this whole layout um, and, and, and being mindful that we have these different type of uses, these uh, host of permitted uses, and um, I think yeah, that's where we can sort of explore which ones do we say, you know what, X use might be, might not be appropriate in this location of, of the activity, but could be fine over here. Um, and just. I think we'd love to land a brewery that had a teasing room and a coffee roaster that also had a front coffee shop that probably would take care of that transition and create some placemaking. So, I mean, some of these things are going to evolve out of getting some users in here and then yep. um, could kind of take care of some of these kind of design expectations on their own once we have some, some activity. So we're, I know Bulos is... <laughs> Um, working hard on already kind of talking about this phase, um, not advertising lots yet, but talking about it to create some buzz and interest. So 
I think after, maybe after. Yeah, if, if I if if I were looking at alternative uses there, and that one <coughs> lot that's kind of right in the middle of the wetlands there, um, that lends itself to a conference space, <coughs> a building, a, a a facility that basically is geared towards meetings and conferences um, for the people in the like the the folks in the, the commercial district that would like to hold a meeting, kind of off-site, but you know, not mm. far away. Um, that's a, the sort of transitional, or that's a transitional type of type of use. But when I talk about placemaking, I'm also talking about placemaking, not just waiting for somebody to come in and open a restaurant with an outdoor area. I, I'm talking about building placemaking into this design so that uh, so that it is there no matter who comes in mm -hmm. or is that sort of a place for people to gather yeah I think you know that this type of, uh, I mean, in, in one respect, as has been stated, this is a great opportunity for the board to have, to have, uh, you know, this con these types of conversations, and it's obviously a great opportunity for the town. I think sometimes when we're talking about commercial development, it gets tricky because there is this kind of chicken or egg thing, and I really, um, I get a little uncomfortable if it starts to feel overly prescriptive and 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 by that I mean getting too far beyond talking about things like setbacks and design standards and um, just things like that I mean I, and I, I think it's it's you know great to to have ideas and I'm, I'm all for placemaking as well um, but I think it is you know when you're talking about something on this scale and you know, at the end of the day, the bulk of this is light industrial, or likely to be primarily light industrial, um, away from the, the commercial anchor area. And um, while I would definitely encourage the applicant to consider ways that they can do some um, sort of public design that can encourage some of those things, um, it is it is going to be tenant driven a lot of it is going to be tenant driven certainly within the parameters of what the ordinance lays out and what the what the board um, you know the, how the board steers it um, and so I, and we I've, we've we've had this challenge before and the board will continue to in the future to the extent that they're that that the focus is on commercial because the the applicants are going to be they're 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 trying to find tenants and it's market driven and it may not come they may not come in the order in which we would ideally like to see them um, so that is a challenge um, we obviously want to establish the parameters such that it helps kind of steer things in the right direction and encourages the right things um, I guess for me as far you know thinking and there have been some really useful questions and discussion around the scale and the nature of the different uses that are allowed, and I think those were helpful reminders and questions from Jay about, you know, we, we, we're sort of focused on light industrial for a bulk of this, but there really are some of these other a lot of these other uses that are permitted, um, and uh, you know, I, I'd say for me personally, outside of certainly not wanting to, you know, certainly preferring not to see in light industrial out, you know, out on the main road um, and wanting to see some common sense type <clears throat> things that we that everyone I think agrees on around buffering of parking and thinking about sight lines as it gets further into subdivision review and beyond um, I guess I wouldn't want to be overly prescriptive or prohibitive um, in, you know in this particular area and I, I do want to commend the applicant and and staff who's worked with them on the thoughtfulness of this approach and it's clear that they're you know certainly compared to you know the past generations with 
that we think of as industrial parks that we're all familiar with. Clearly, there's been a lot more thought that's gone into um, the design considerations and, and placemaking such that it's um, feasible at this point. So I, I definitely commend everyone for that. Um, just glancing back at my notes to make sure I'm not uh, missing anything. Um, I do absolutely agree that you know that that that's a lot of real estate in general, and certainly for that commercial piece. Um, but I think again, for purposes of master plan or this kind of subset of master planning, um, I think that it, it appears that it's been thought through, and, and there's there's access, and there will be opportunities to flush out. Uh, interior circulation and connectivity and some of those other things. Um, you know, I, for me, and, and this again, this is this is master plan that we're talking about here. To me, it feels like folks are generally comfortable with the big picture here. Um, the question comes in, and that this is really where I feel like I'm sort of passing the torch a little bit because I won't be on this board uh, after tonight. So um, I'm going to sort of defer to 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 you folks, my colleagues, thinking about what you're going to be the ones who are going to be, you know, handling this going forward, and to the, the, to the extent that you think there may be certain specific conditions or other guidance that that um, you'd want to put on to sort of attach to any master plan approval tonight, that's something to consider. Um, but to me, it. It, it seems that uh, in terms of the big picture here for master planning purposes, feels like we're there, maybe with some caveats around buffering and some of these other things that have been discussed. And so what that looks like in terms of an approval, I'm not totally sure. And again, those are things that are going to be coming back to you guys. So what do you think? Well, is the, is the do, I mean, is I think we're sitting, we want to approve the master plan for this particular portion tonight, right? So we just take a well, take a yeah, vote without yeah, the gallery. Just to remind you, master plan, you are establishing the space right. and bulk standards. Lock it right. in. The, the, this locks it right. in. You don't get another bite out of the app on site right. plan or something. So if you're comfortable with what's been demonstrated, then that's fine. But I do yeah. want to be clear that this isn't because there aren't other master plans where the space and bulk is already sort of set in the right. And so, so, so this, 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 there is, I, I just want to be sure that it's yeah. clear that this isn't typical of our, of our master plan approvals okay. where there's, a, there's <laughs> bites at the apple. There are other bites at the apple, and I'm not trying to discourage you from doing an approval, so don't sort of misread that. I right. just want to be so, clear that. Yeah, and so related to that, one possible line of discussion would be, you know, does the board want to... Uh, Require further codification around things like the or the the, uh, the Access, buffering. Well, the accessory and building too. I would, that was something, but I think we can work language around developing something with staff um, to address most of those concerns. It, you know, I you're ninety nine percent there in my book. It's just yeah. some of these tiny details that you know it would be worthwhile to to iron out. Um, you know. You have a suggestion, <laughs> and I, I'd certainly, I'm personally, as one board member, I would be comfortable with delegating that to staff. But if others feel that they would want certain things to come back, then yeah. chime in. A quick question on procedure: um, if if there were language worked up, is is this something that we could see in a cons consent item two weeks from now? Is that, is that our next board meeting? Is two weeks or when we? Our next meeting is January until the 14th. Oh, geez. We got a break, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it sounds like there, um, as I was jotting notes, there are a few things to still sort of iron out, which I agree don't sound like they're huge hurdles, but in terms of the uh, sort of parking buffering, you know, and I think we have a language we've talked about that we could borrow from. It would be good to hear a little more discussion from the board about what your thoughts are on accessory buildings. Um, and then I guess the other question would be, you know, do you want to, as, as I sort of was talking about before, we sort of have these three different buckets of permitted uses. Mm -hmm. Do we want to try to really identify those and sort of vet those out a little bit more about which type of permitted uses? And without getting too refined, I'm really talking about 
residential, commercial, and then these light industrial that don't have design standards. I'm not talking about, you know, difference between retail and re restaurant. I don't, I don't think that's the appropriate sort of slicing of the uh, permitted uses, but I think there are these distinct, three distinct use types. And so do we want to really talk about which type of distinct use types are seem appropriate on which type of use category? I think we have front lots, back lots, and um, uh, what do we call the other one? Commercial anchor or commercial retail or what have you. Um, so I think those, those are sort of the notes I've been jotting as far as questions and, you know, the board gets to a place where you're comfortable. That, that's fine. Um, I, I, I still yeah, have a question well, about placemaking and you know, uh, yeah. that was another one I had yeah. written. One but sure but I, I'm, I'm glad you, you framed it the way you did because that was I'm looking at some of at these lots. Um, so let's say you have a garage repair shop, which is possible. Yeah, correct? Uh, uh, yeah, Automotive repair? Not like that. Uh, is that? Yes, sales, rental, and service of heavy equipment, specialized motor vehicles. All right. Sure. Would, yeah. you, would we want that on the street, or would a, a use like that be to the back? Because <coughs> in terms of, of the visual from the street, um, do we want to do we want to do something with that? And I, I think that's the question that that uh, Jay started to raise in in my mind. Are there some parts of the uh, light industrial that are really more suited to a back lot than a front lot, where people driving by see what's happening? So, are you suggesting? And this is just a thought. I'm trying to rephrase kind of what you said is, and what Jay said. Are you suggesting color coding that map for permitted for to define the three uses? You know. These two uses could be you could combine the two colors, make green and yellow, make blue. Uh, are you are you suggesting that that's what we do to better define what can go there? Because I'm not sure that that's. No, I, I don't know that that's necessarily. I guess it's um, again, you know, sort of in the, in the narrative, it, it talks about commercial retail anchor, but when you go to our standards, the light industrial uses are allowed in any of these areas. And so I just want to be clear from a staffing perspective that when you approve this master plan, if they were to come in in the future with a light industrial use in that commercial area, is that something we're, we're comfortable with? Or conversely, where we've talked about the light industrial being over on the right side of the page, they were coming with a restaurant, retail, whatever you want to, would we be comfortable with that? Um, that sounds like something that, that you by yourself and I think that maybe that's something that yourself and, and Dan work out and then come back to us with what you worked out, I guess. I don't know if we, for us to go th through that in, in again, a public forum like this, and it would take a long time. And I guess that's why I was suggesting that, you know, it's not worth parsing the difference between retail and restaurant. It's really about... <coughs> Residential, and again, they've largely taken residential off the table. Um, if I yeah, and I'm, just to clarify, our proposal that we submitted is that the Payne Road parcel, we'll call it, what's up on the map there, we're proposing that the space and bulk standards be what's provided in your packet and that that parcel meet the commercial design standards. So we're not proposing that... As of right now, light industrial and the other standards that are the next piece, um, the front and back lots, be allowed to come up into that area. Um, that's our intention. So we felt like the gateway coming in from Payne Road should, be, should meet the commercial design standards um, and be those uses. I said earlier, if five years goes by and there's no viable use out there, the zoning allows light industrial mm -hmm. out to that area with a buffer to Payne Road and a buffer to the downs. So maybe over time, we need to come back to the board and say, hey, you know, this parcel can't be used. We want to come up with a solution to deal with that. But that's not what we're proposing. So we're proposing 
for master plan that's before you today that meet the commercial design standards and to be that. Um, and then the remainder we're proposing to follow these rules, which on the front lots you need to have the fenestration requirements and do those things. In the back lots you have a lesser requirement. So we've been thinking it more in, in those terms. You know, if a restaurant decides to go in here, we think it would be great to service the employees. Our perspective hasn't been, and the restaurant should meet some new, different design standard just because it's a restaurant. Does it, does it really matter um, if it's a restaurant or if it's a office, front <coughs> office of a light industrial use? Um, we think the fenestration requirements and, and such, um, you know, would make it fit into the district. So that, I think that's where we were coming from, more <coughs> around treatment of the areas versus uses. And to me, given all that, and again, it's a, it's a, it is a tough, and this is somewhat uncharted territory, I think, but to me, just personally, and as a board member, I, given, given what the applicant has said, and what we've talked about, um, given the nature of this site and the way that it's sort of broken up, um, I'm not inclined to, again, be overly, overly prescriptive within that. It starts to, to me, it starts to feel, and I, I totally appreciate what Jay's line of questioning and that it, at, at, at the bare minimum, I think he just wants clear kind of marching orders and a clear understanding of what the board is or is not saying. Um, but to me, I think it's sort of striking the striking, trying to strike the right balance between laying out some parameters, um, laying out a, a sensible master plan that takes some placemaking considerations into consideration, while still allowing for there's there's as I said before there's there's a market component here, and the the owner needs to be able to attract tenants, right. attract buyers. Um, and while Jay rightly pointed out that by approving the master plan, really setting in stone the space and bulk standards, there are, there are other bites of the apple in terms of some of the other, um, you know, the, the other details of individual site design and subdivision details. So, um, so it, it feels, it's, to me, it starts to feel overly prescriptive and sort of cumbersome to, to start. To, given the nature of this particular site, but that's, that's so. Why, yeah. So we could approve it, the master plan, based on what we see here today, knowing that if they want to come back and do something else in the commercial retail space, they'll come back and ask us for that. Um, you know, and then as far as the turnaround that I the, that I thought might be nice, and the and the and the place to meet. None of those are required by code. None of them are required in the zoning. So that would be nice to have, but I don't think we can require that. So I'm, a, I'm fine with approving this master plan based on what they presented here tonight um, with maybe the one caveat that Jay um, works with Dan and, and is comfortable that the, 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 the zoning is... You know, as, I want you to be comfortable, I guess, is my, my point. But I'm okay with approving it the way it's laid out today. And, and we've given them some of our suggestions and some of our thoughts. But again, to me, if it's not required in the zoning, then it's tough for, for, for me to sit here and tell them you got to, you know, you got to pave the trails and you got to do a turnaround and you got to do public space or whatever. It, and and so, I'm looking at at section 20 C, uh, period 10 on placemaking that is in the code. And it's located, um, something located at the core of the pedestrian realm. Um, so there is actually some provisions for it. In the, in and, that, and, that's, and that's true. And I, I think and we, we run into this on other, <clears throat> on, in other cases too. And it's sort of, you know, we can't design it for them either. You know, we can't design it in real time. So it, in one respect, it does come down to sort of what what is the board comfortable approving tonight? 
could comment on a couple of the outstanding yeah. items. I mean, one is um, the buffer strip, so the 10-foot strip. I mean, we're, in terms of screening and landscaping, that was our sort of intention of that 10-foot area. So um, we can add language to make that clear in our standards. Um, on the accessory buildings, what we're anticipating is these small buildings that are typically in the back that are um, for some additional storage. Um, those things are things the board would look at through site plan. So um, we weren't really thinking of those as prominent buildings or principal buildings that you would typically be concerned about. So we, I, mean, I can look at additional language around that, but that's something that would come to the board and you'd kind of work with it in your site plan ordinance um, process. Um, and I understand the placemaking comment for sure. Um, we've been thinking about this area as you know, the demand for that being different, if you will, than kind of residential parts of the project or the kind of mixed use parts of the project um, and be kind of more natural, natural based, open space based. But um, we're happy to look at incorporating something and um, kind of presenting that to the board at preliminary subdivision and, and kind of vetting it, vetting it there if, um, if that works for the board in that. You know, we're kind of eager to get into the details and uh, get finer grain than we have here. You know, our master plan is great, but it also has limitations around how far we can go on designing anything without knowing what the rules are. That's one of the, <laughs> the fallbacks, too, is we don't have rules until you agree to them around setbacks and lot sizes. So there's only kind of so far we can go engineering-wise, without knowing what the rules are. It's a bit of a chicken and egg, too. So um, we're interested in figuring out what an appropriate placemaking is, recognizing this as light industrial versus, say, the, the town center. If that helps. Thanks. That's helpful. Just yeah. uh, I just wanted to um, say that I'm very comfortable with what they've shown us so far. And I don't want, I, I tend to agree with you. I think a lot of this is going to be market driven. And I'm not concerned about, uh, for instance, uh, the service station in, in the front lots. I, I suspect they may be more inclined to go in the back lots for economic reasons or whatever else. But I think this is going to be more dri market driven and, and see how it develops from there. Um, but I'm very comfortable. I mean, it's pretty clear to me they want light industrial in one area and commercial retail in the other. Um, and in terms of the, um, the place setting, I'm not familiar with any light industrial parks anywhere where they have a common area. Most buildings, businesses have a, a, a picnic bench or something out in the back where they, the employees can gather it if they want to go outside for lunch or something like that. I'm not familiar, you know. Yeah, it, but we're, we're calling, the, this is being called an innovation hub. I mean, an innovation development. Uh, and we're starting with a green field rather than a brown field where there's a building here and a building there. And you know, it was designed many years ago. So um, starting from, from the beginning with a green field, um, why not? Well, I, I, you know. Yeah, and I really appreciate yeah. the offer to look at that. That satisfies me in terms of where you'd be going with it, um, that you're going you're gonna to try and do that. But we have the opportunity to do something better, do something different, do something that people say, geez, you mean this is an industrial area? doesn't look like it. You know, it looks, it well, looks, it looks mm, nice. It I doesn't understand look what you're saying, industrial. but I'm... I'm I'm looking at it from a practical point of view, too, from what light industrial is typically. If this was a business park, it might be a little different situation, you know, like Southboro or something like that. But um, I, I don't know. This is just my personal opinion. I just don't see that happening. But if they want to, if they can incorporate it somehow. Yeah. But some of the, what, uh, what Jay has brought up is that some of the, uh, some of the uses really are more towards the business park. In other words, this, this really can, while well, it says light industrial, yeah. it offers the opportunity for more of a mixture. Well, I, my impression is the area just south of this, <coughs> just below this, is where you're kind of transitioning and you might have some business type elements to it. 
Is that correct? That's what we're thinking about. But also yeah. within the light industrial area, there could be kind of high tech uses or other uses that are allowed, say in a business park or in other parts of the project. Um, truthfully, another kind of advantage of this design <laughs> guidance is that I know the board struggled over the years with allowing projects you want to allow <laughs> based on the design standards too, around kind of contemporary materials. Um, and I think you've done a nice job with some buildings like the salt pump, for example, or others where probably doesn't meet the design standards as they were conceived, you know, 15 years ago. So I think some interesting architecture and some compatibility can happen in the innovation district where it is a mixture of kind of light industrial buildings you would expect, but also some uses that are, you know, high tech, that are research, that are kind of innovation, you know, innovation uses that can coexist together. That's the goal is to coexist together at a, and look, uh, coordinated and um, be attractive but different than the design standards. And that's actually a point that I, I want to be sure we touch on because um, I think one of the things um, that's been talked about is really having sort of these the design standards that are, are, are spelled out in the, in the submission for the back lots and front lots sort of be what carries. But it, it's worth noting that there's only one, two, three, four, five. Two, three, six uses to which the design standards don't apply, sort of regardless of where they are. And all the other uses, the design standards still apply. The design standards don't apply to manufacturing assembly, food processing, mini warehousing, contract offices, motor vehicle repair and service facilities, and sale, rental, and service of heavy equipment. The standards um, talk about find it here in a minute, that the commercial design standards, all developments within the district must be consistent with the commercial design standards, um, with the exception of the uses allowed under section D14. Those are those six that I just read to you. So one of the things that I heard mentioned is that for, you know, only the standards that were talked about with the 50% registration and such would apply to those front and back lots. That's not entirely the way it would work. If a retail use, a restaurant use, uh, any of the uses, any, any but those six uses come in for any of these light industrial lots, this board would still have to apply the commercial design standards. Now, as Dan mentioned, the commercial design standards, this board has room to, to play with, so to speak. You need to find that it's generally consistent and do, do the due diligence that you do. Um, but I do want to be sure that we're sort of all clear on that point. Um, because I started to hear something different um, that, um, so hopefully I've made that point clear. If I haven't, thanks. Uh, okay. <laughs> One point I wanted to make um, was related to what Roger and others, Roger and Rachel were talking about a minute ago, is that I, we're appropriately focused on this aspect of the overall master plan. But, and I think one of the challenging things about this project broadly, talking about the downs overall, all the phases, is that it's an even bigger overall scale and there's a, there's a time element to it that's hard for, to get our heads around sometimes. And so when we talk about placemaking and mixed use and some of these other things, um, for me, I think about it not only within the context of this, this aspect of the, of the overall project, but I try to remind myself that there are this will also connect to other parts of the overall Downs property, which will eventually, hopefully, have a lot of other um, public type spaces, and and it may not happen for a while, but um, those things will be there. So, so to the extent that there may not immediately be something within this immediate light industrial area, um, I think it's helpful to just remind ourselves that it does ultimately tie into the broader Downs development, which has, by design, um, a lot of other moving parts to it, including things that relate to the public realm and public gathering spaces and things like that. So, you gonna add something else? No, I, you know, I think, um, I think, I think Jay's clarification of what we can do a little bit later down the line is really helpful. Um, you know, and always trying to remember that you're <clears throat> at this stage of the game, we're really, we're 
kind of doing a half half foot in the thirty thousand foot view, but then the other half of the foot's on the ground with the five foot setback, you know, and it's like, oh, you know, and you're kind of bouncing in between the two. Um, but as far as giving you those guidelines and the framework to do what you guys got to do to sell these lots, to build these lots out, I think there's enough information for me at least. There's enough information here that I feel comfortable with to say that, you know, I, I'm comfortable getting an approval tonight um, from what I've, I've seen here. Yeah. Uh, so I. Yeah. We have a draft motion here that staff's been. Marking up. <laughs> Marking up as, to reflect our discussion, which I greatly yeah, appreciate, I think before as always. You, you make these as a motion, yeah. let's yeah. put them on the table and sure. banter them about, because I think there's still a question about what the board wants to do with the accessory buildings, if we just want to. So anyway. Let, if you, so what, I'm not sure I understand the question about the accessory buildings. What exactly, what exactly is the... The problem I have is I don't know what an accessory building is defined to as. Me is that it start, a thousand I, feet? Is it a shed? Yeah. Is it a dumpster? I don't know. Right. I, you know. I'm not, uh, what, is, what is the question there? Uh, so right now the design standards as, as written is an accessory build. It says accessory buildings are not required to meet the above design standards. And the above design standards are the ones that talk about fenestration and such. Um, right. So an accessory building is, you know, we have principal uses and then they're, you know. I think Dan had a, didn't, you had a comment. Yeah, I mean, in the... Uh, about industrial that. areas, there's often smaller outbuildings that are used for storage. Um, typically, they're you know behind the principal building. We didn't spell that out in here. Um, and our cons the reason we added that asterisk was, you know, if it's a shed, you don't want to add a 50% fenestration requirement. You know, a bunch of fake windows to the shed um, or some other building like that. So. That was our intent, not that it didn't meet the setbacks or other things, um, that it wouldn't need to meet the building form requirements, you know, minimum building height and fenestration. Um, we didn't go to the extent of doing a, you know, a diagram to show where an accessory building would go. We, we thought that would be handled through site plan review. Um, I, and we didn't think it'd probably happen on every lot, you know, there might, so that's why it wasn't. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't have an issue with, with that exemption. I mean, I think all of a sudden they come and they want a five thousand square foot accessory building. That that's, that's my problem. concern. If it becomes the, if the know, tail, so. if the tail tries to wag the dog, then that's a different thing. Right. Right. The size right. of the when shed versus different question. the accessory building have to be pre, you know, when when they pre, when they come back to the board. We would for review site. it, and if they said it's an accessory, but we administratively say, no, this isn't accessory, right. this is now a principal building, that right. well, could be figured I mean, if, look, I mean, if you get a 100,000 square foot building there, and then they yeah. come in and say, I want a 10,000 accessory building, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? Compared to, you know, because that's really small compared to whatever it is they got going on, that's just an accessory building for them. Right. But a 10,000 square foot building might, you might want to say something about it. It's not cost. <laughs> no. Accessory buildings aren't really cost effective, so no, I know. It's, but it's, what I'm saying I'm sure is the language here. It doesn't give yeah. me that clarification. Right. You know. But but I think it from a, from a master plan perspective, to be talking too much about. I it's nice to nice to mention that yes, we're going to be reviewing the accessory buildings as you as you find tenants and they want an accessory building. But I don't know if that from a master plan, we start talking too much about the accessory units. And again, I will mention that the design standards are going to apply to all but six use types. Right. And so in the design standards, there's discussion about accessory buildings being complementary and consistent <coughs> with the principal building. So, so to your, you know, Nick, I don't know if that helped you or not. It, it may not, but I, I do just want to, again, sort of make sure we're sort of remembering that if there's very limited uses of the 54 limited uses, there's only six to which design standards are not going to be applicable. Uh, and my intent is not to put windows on sheds. You know, if, you know that's not what I'm after. It's I worry about the size. Uh, how about a cupola? What, what is the size? I, I think it's more of the square footage I'm worried about. How big is an accessory building? You know, at what point do we stop referring to it as a primary and accessory? I mean, what's, well, the, what's the size difference between the yeah. two? You know, I mean, yeah, it, I it seems like a very obvious question. I just don't want to get in that fight down the line. Yeah, the definition's, I think, pretty broad. It's like, Secondary and incidental 
to the principal that's the definition that's it, building. Right? That's um, the definition. So we've lived this long. I can live with this. Yeah. We've made it this far, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we've, like, we'll be reviewing the accessory building at the time that they do the submittal for the whatever the building is. So, I mean, we could, we could, we could, we could yeah. process, you know, okay. discuss it. If the rest of this board is comfortable. So I think I'm starting to generally hear that this board's comfortable with staff working with the applicant on sort of putting the, the final touches on the space and bulk standards. Is that... And, and that's around parking, uh, uh, buffering up the parking. And really, we, I think we're comfortable with a 10-foot setback. We just want a little additional language like is in the B3, similar to what's in the B3 about, you know, it just has a little language about screening. Uh, then I guess the other question I have is, as part of the plan development process, this board, you know, talks about development patterns and, and sort of the mix of uses. And as, as, as Dan has mentioned, right now they're talking about sort of the commercial anchor uses being sort of that bigger bucket of uses, not the six light industrial uses or the residential, but really being that, you know, 40 odd commercial type activities. Are those really being the principal uses that we're talking about being allowed in the commercial, on that commercial, what was called commercial retail lots or lot? And then sort of allowing all the use types, but for the, the residential use types on the light industrial lots. Um, so, so are you saying that should be a condition of the... Uh, I, I, I just want to... No, I think he's... I, he, I'm just trying to clarify. If you guys are going to try to make a... Mo if you're going to make a motion tonight, and it sounds like we're heading that way, and that's fine, I want to be very clear, because there's still some things that are untied, and I think we can tie them up. Um, so I'm just trying to be sure I have them on the table, and I... Yeah, we'll try to craft these into a motion, um, but you are, you're comfortable with staff sort of taking the final, you're, you're asking staff to take, with the applicant to take the final lift and, and, and complete the space in bulk. The motion is based yes. on this okay. the plans yes. right in front of us. Yep. Okay, as laid out right there. And then, so you know, I'm, you're I'm not, comfortable yep. with that. And, and, and again, and this is my, I, I also want to be, is this the conceptual master plan that you're asking to be approved? And, and it, I know this is a minor point, but the one we have, I think that we have a lot uh, that is shown as a light industrial anchor. So I want to be sure it's, and, and you've talked about in the past that the light industrial anchor could become multiple lots. And so I've not, a, this is a, a concern I have. I just want to be sure when we, when we write up a final motion for you that we're, we're you identify the, 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 what we're approving, um, and that that's, that's still light industrial as I understand it, right? Correct. Yeah, so the use type isn't changing, which I don't, so I don't think it really changes the... Um, it doesn't say anchor. What's that? Right, it just, just doesn't say anchor. Which, yeah. But the use types and the standards, I think, yeah. are still applicable. So. Yeah, and through subdivision, we want to work with the board on how to um, arrange the subdivision so that lots can be combined and um, sure. consolidated. And when they do that, perhaps some of the private drives aren't built. So, you know, that's the light industrial anchor site kind of shows how those six lots could be combined into one use, one user versus having six lots. So that's, I don't know, they're, they're different because it's. In, uh, all I'm trying to do is we need to have a plan on record that's the master plan this board approved. Mm -hmm. So is it the November plan or is it the December plan? Jack, uh, Jay, on, on that light industrial anchor, yeah. okay, um, right now it's designed as one lot, but it can conceivably it could be broken up into multiple yeah. lots. Sure. So. Yep, that's, that's So I think we're, gonna ask, we're, gonna, we're asking, they're asking so to the December. that plan. Yeah. And knowing that the lots could be combined in any shape or form, and which is fine with me. It's, it's intended to all be driven be by the. It's going to be modular. driven by whoever. Right. You know, we want people to. We want this to be successful. We want those lots to sell. So it, it's we've got to make it. So yeah, we'd request this yeah. plan. It's, it's it's the most up to date. Okay. I don't see it as an issue. I just want to be sure we're clear on what the plan. <laughs> So it's nice going to be the plan of record. Reminds everybody that even though we're approving this as it is, it could be, 
you know. It could be one big law. Right. Thick. <laughs> but it could be. Right? Sure. So, and that's fine. So I think Jamel's been writing so, a couple of conditions, and I've been writing a couple of conditions. Um, Do we want to combine them? Probably want to combine them. If, uh, so, so again, I, I think I've started working on a condition that talks about the buffering of parking lots. I've started working on one about staff finalizing the details for the approved use types and space and bulk for the, the use types. Um, what, what type of conditions have you been working on? Uh, just enhanced space and bulk standards. So includes includes streetscape treatment and buffering of parking lots similar to the B3 zoning district. All right. So really we're talking about two two conditions is enhancing the, the so now why don't you come now we need to we wordsmith them. <laughs> no you wordsmith those I'm gonna take a five minute break go to the bathroom and <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'm going sorry. I'm going. <laughs> All right. All right it won't we'll be fine. Let's do less than that. <laughs> So in terms of the got that in the filibuster. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Because uh, that codifies the uses that can be on the commercial right. retail. So the question is, okay. my understanding was, again, for the commercial retail anchors, because I don't think this is, and maybe it is spelled out in the documents, but I didn't see it. You indicate, it's pretty clear your, your intention, and you said it tonight, for the commercial retail anchor to be sort of not those light industrial uses. Mm -hmm. but I don't know that that's explicitly spelled out in your okay. submission. And I think, again, because the zoning, if that's something this board is interested in, in, in codifying, and because those land uses are allowed otherwise in that area, that it's worth sort of codifying as part of this master plan. Right. If that's not something this board's concerned about, let me know. And we'll You're talking about the commercial retail space. I'm only talking about what's shown on red up, up on the yeah. on the screens. Well, and allowing sort of every other use activity, but for those six that don't have the design standards that apply to them. I'm, I'm just going to quickly ask: Is it conceivable then that three months from now they come back and they say, you know what, we've got light industrial filled out, but they want to be on Payne Road, yeah. so we're going to move commercial all the way to the other side, and you guys come back with a whole new map. Is it conceivable? Sure. Yeah. You, so can always amend a, you can always amend a plan. So I, you know, when you ask if, like, for me, if, is it really important that I find out whether or not light industrial uses can be used in that area, it sounds to me like it could switch in a moment anyways, you know. Yeah, our intention is to meet the design standards on the red parcel. Yeah. Right. And for light industrial uses in the rest of the innovation district, or the uses that do not require the commercial right. commercial design standards, we meet what we submitted to the board. For the uses that may happen in that innovation district that require commercial design standards, we need to meet the commercial design standards, but we would comply with the setbacks as we spelled them out. So that's that's the intention, and I think mm -hmm. the clarification on the design standard piece you know, in the rest of the innovation district for those uses that need to meet it. So. Yeah, I think that's important to clarify. So, so when I understand, we're voting tonight on the, the red being commercial retail. Yes. Right, and the rest light, light industrial. And I suspect that in three months, if all of a sudden um, Rocky gets this um, large commercial business, wants to go in the red area, he'll be back here talking to us about changing that. If it looks that attractive, you mean if it's all some sort of a light industrial use? No, no. If it's a regular, like a like a large, like a Wex, want to go there in, instead of a commercial retail, they would be back to amend that. To be clear, that would be allowed. That's one of those yeah. forty yeah. type mm -hmm. use right. and That's yeah. why I'm trying to yeah. not get too cute with <laughs> defining these right. buckets yeah. of yeah. uses. But we could do that. But that would be through yeah. a site plan process. Yeah. They wouldn't have to come back through master plan. Right. <laughs> right. So we would see it again. Right. You're going to see everything You're going to see everything again. Oh, yeah. again. <laughs> Corey's the uh, only one. Well, actually. <laughs> you're going to see everything again. <laughs> but never. again, the master plan is what sets the stage for what you can see. And I well, guess that's what, they, what I want. This is what they would like to do. Okay? Right. But things may change. Mm -hmm. So, and they don't want to, they wouldn't want to miss a, a, a great opportunity because they said, oh, we've got to put a commercial or retail, you know, mm -hmm. So, so now I'm hearing the board being comfortable with light industrial uses well, now going in the red area. 
No, no, at this time we're proving it just like it is. Let's just no, go like, there. Yeah. Let's just go there. Right, Let's just okay. do this. It's the, the, board's, the board's preference yeah. to see that the yeah. design standards apply on that, in that, on that land. Yes, yeah. yeah. well, that was understand. I think that's the, yeah. that's the upshot of it. Yeah. yeah. So we prove it that way. I very much like that you put the space and bulk standards right on the slide. That's nice. Knows his audience. Yeah, I think he's working on. Yeah. Okay. But then I just need to we need to think about. Then that's the board superseding the zoning, and the board really can't do that with a condition. So, so the question mm -hmm. is, what what I'm what I'm struggling with is. I understand, and the applicant is, is there. Everyone's there as to having the commercial design standards apply in the commercial anchor area. That's great. The zoning explicitly says for these six uses, design standards don't apply. So this board doesn't have the ability to waive that. that that's a variant. We, we sort of just had this, right? That's a zoning standard. You. You don't have the ability to sort of say no design standards do apply because it, and that, I guess that's why I keep circling back to if we're okay with those light industrial uses being in this district, that's fine. I, but we, I just want to be sure we're clear on then design standards. Hopefully, the applicant would, you know, as they're suggesting, if those type of uses go there, would come in with ones that are consistent with the design standards, but it's not something that this board would then have the authority to require. And that's why I keep circling back to the question of, are we okay with light industrial uses being in that commercial anchor lot? I mean, can we work language around if light industrial commercial is to be placed within that area? They would be in front of the board for discussion? Is there something? It would be, because it'd be coming in for site plan. Mm -hmm. So, but okay. the design standards wouldn't apply. But you're saying if a, if a service station, if they decide to put a service station in there. Yeah, a station's going to have design standards apply to it no matter where it is. Oh, well, okay. That's not one of the That's six uses. That's not one of the six, okay. Right. So you're talking about a, was a mechanic shop? Mechanic shop, uh, yeah, warehouse. Manufacturing and assembly, food processing, mini warehouse, contractor's offices, motor vehicle, vehicle repair. No, that's what I mean. Sale rental service. Has anyone ever asked that question? That was Let's not that, go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's to us. <laughs> that was an approval we gave six, seven months ago. Okay. That was an amendment to the ordinance that came through as a. Yeah, to go back to my question of if a uh, vehicle repair, yep. not a service station, but a vehicle repair, mm -hmm. were to go in there, we have no control over it. It wouldn't, the design standards wouldn't apply. Now, we're hearing the applicant say that their intention is to apply them, but I just... Yeah, and our I, intention is not to, at this point, proceed with those uses in that location. There's another layer in that there's a buffer, minimum buffer required mm -hmm. from Payne Road and the Downs Road to these light industrial uses, which also helps with the aesthetics of the gateway into the project. So... Um, I guess my question now is, you know, you've pointed out some of the issues we may encounter. So what are the, what are the solutions being proposed around running into those? I, I guess where, where I was starting to hedge towards was, as part of this board's master plan approval, you do have the ability through plan development process and master plan to really talk about the, the, the uh, pattern of development and the mix of uses and where things are appropriate to go or not to go. What I'm hearing said, but I don't want to, is where I'm headed is it might just be a lot easier to exclude those six industrial type uses that don't have design standards uh, uh, applied to them, to not allow those uses on just in the, what's in red. Okay. Just on just the a different, lot. A different yeah. way of achieving right. what. Okay. Mm -hmm. that talking sense. about yeah that's a solution yeah. Okay. It, but it, I it's a solution that the property owner and applicant are comfortable with and um, 
No, yeah, I, we're comfortable right with that. Now. I mean, we're yeah. proposing okay. as these these space in bulk are proposed for the Payne Road parcel, we're proposing those with the commercial design standards. Mm -hmm. So if we want to come back to you some point in time and remove that commercial design standard component, then we come back and we amend this master plan and we meet the board's needs at that time. Mm -hmm. We're comfortable with that. Is that that's, right. that's not a going that's a master plan right. amendment. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. totally fine. Okay. <coughs> so with that general understanding, the condition I'm language I'm sort of working with is that the applicant will work with staff to finalize the details of the approved use types and space and bulk standards for the commercial retail anchor properties as well as the light industrial lots. As one condition. Another condition would be to uh, enhance the space and bulk standards to include streetscape buffering of parking lots uh, similar to the B3 district. I think those are the only two conditions. Jamel, is there anything? That's, that's fine. Well, we got to put that oh, yeah, going back. To All right. <laughs> we'll <laughs> yep. Go back to the, uh, yep. the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, yes, I, I agree that staff and, and the applicant can definitely hammer it out. Uh, I wonder if it's wise for us to, as a board to state what our goal is in that condition, you know, with the intent of. So I, if you reread what sure. you wrote as a sentence, Good. if you can. Yep. Uh, so the applicant to work with staff to finalize the details of the approved use types and space and bulk standards for the commercial slash retail anchor properties as well as the light industrial properties. Yeah, so you just say you're going to negotiate them with them to come up with the standard, right? Like, I want to know if this board We're going to build off the standard that's here and then the discussion that we've had. Okay. So there's going to be some subtle tweaks. I don't think it's big move. My question was whether or not it was worthwhile to include language that says with the intent of the six, you know, the six uses being, I don't know, uh, excluded. Excluded. Yeah, excluded. We want to make sure that you have, when you go into these negotiations to hammer out these details, you've got your framework that you're building in. I mean, but if you don't think you need. That. I guess I, I'm, I'm basing it, that, that's why I was so explicit with that discussion okay. <laughs> and sort of kept hammering the point home that I, I feel comfortable based on this discussion. You're okay with your language. I, Okay. I, I'm okay that it, you know, and if all heck breaks loose, then, then we'll, go back to the table. We'll, okay. we'll come back and see you. Okay. Right. If, if we can't work these out, I mean, that is the, the fail safe of a condition that says applicant to work with staff. If we get in the room and say we can't come to an agreement, it's, well, we haven't met this condition yet. Now what do we do? Back to you guys. Okay. So I think that is sort of the fail safe. Try and get it out of this paper for you. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> I'm tired. I think, I think <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the torch has been passed. the advantage of doing it sort of workshop format. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, 40 people waiting to put their mm -hmm. next yeah. thing, sir. While we're waiting for this, um, can I make a uh, suggestion to Rocky and, and Plain Department? Is um, I think in the future uh, you might want to give some consideration to occasionally putting an article in the leader or one of the local newspapers just to let them know how things are progressing because I'm sure most of the townspeople will be very eager to be following, you know, the, you've got road closures and everything else and just dying to drive up there to find out what's going on. Just to get, you know, up to date every once in a while, just to let, let them know what's going on. I, I think that's great advice and I, I appreciate that. Um, 
you can get in the downs from the from the Payne Road side. They're still open every day, and you can come and take a look. Uh, but that's a good. I think that's good advice on, on getting more information out. I've been involved with the public safety building, and you know, I know that group has been trying to to get stuff published uh, and keep you know, keep people informed. Yeah, thank you. It's a good idea. For the next thirty years. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it's not going to take that long. <laughs> How many terms away is that for you? I won't live that long. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Okay. All right. Okay. Making room for a cemetery well, on that side. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have, to have to be like New Orleans above ground to get into the wetlands. So before I read this, thanks as always to staff, but even more so tonight because there's a lot of on-the-fly work done here to try to synthesize a lot of things and push us to get to some some clear conclusions. Uh, but I will put the motion out there. I move to approve the conceptual master plan titled Innovation District, proposed by Crossroads Holdings LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Girl Palmer, dated December 2018, with the following conditions. Number one, work with staff to finalize the details of the approved use types and space and bulk standards for the commercial retail anchor, as well as light industrial properties. Number two, enhance the space and bulk standards to include streetscape buffering and parking lots similar to the B3, buffering of, sorry, I'll, I'll start again. Enhance the space and bulk standards to include streetscape buffering of parking lots similar to the B3 zoning district. It's a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. You have some staff report. Uh, staff report. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so a few things. Um, the council and the planning board will be holding a uh, joint workshop on the Piper Shores Dorado Drive contract zone uh, project on January 9th, 2019. Uh, the time is to be determined, but I just wanted to note that for existing and future board members. Um, so likely to start probably six or seven. But details to come. Yeah. Uh, and then tomorrow night, the council is holding a workshop on land use uh, before their regularly scheduled meeting, um, that will be held at 6 p.m. Um, I think that's specifically on zoning and contract zoning. Those are some of the questions that have been asked that they want to hear a little bit about. And uh, we do have Mylars for the Eastern Village 13th Amendment subdivision plan that need to be signed tonight uh, by the board. Right. Happy holidays. Uh, that is Saturday, January 12th at 8 a.m. We'll so send after out, the joint meeting with the council? It is. We'll send out more details for that. It's probably at least <laughs> three or four storms away. Any other board any other board comments before we adjourn? We're gonna miss you. All right. Yeah. This is really your yeah. last meeting? This is it. <laughs> are you gonna come as the public? Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be here. <laughs> I'm gonna be here for public comment every every three weeks. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank